And did you know that Jesus um, got angry during the last week of his life? We think about the gentle Jesus, the gracious Jesus, the loving Jesus, but Jesus also was a person who showed righteous anger sometimes. 100% God, 100% man, perfect in every way, but yet still got angry. And we're gonna talk about that in just a few minutes. This begins or marks the beginning of Holy Week. And from today until next Sunday, Jesus did things every day that were very significant and profound. And so what I'd like to do is to point you guys, not right this second, but at least sometime uh, today, preferably, to the app, the church app. And every day this week, if you have your notifications turned on, you will receive a push notification from the church with the events of Jesus' life that happened during the corresponding day. Does that make sense? Uh, with some hyperlinks or some links to scripture that show you the different places where these events occur in the New Testament. And so each day you'll be able to read what happened in Jesus' life and follow along. Today, beginning with Palm Sunday, we call this the triumphal entry where Jesus entered Jerusalem. And we're also going to slip over a little bit into Monday today where Jesus did something that may be a little surprising uh, to you, where Jesus showed a little bit of righteous anger or indignation. And so Palm Sunday, Jesus entered Jerusalem to begin the last events before his trial, his arrest, his trial, his crucifixion, and his resurrection. Jesus healed Lazarus a couple weeks before this final week. And when he raised Lazarus from the dead, that caused a shot that was heard around the religious world. And the Pharisees and religious leaders paid very close attention to what Jesus had done. And it made it unsafe for Jesus because they wanted to kill him even more. But his popularity and notoriety was growing. And so the Bible tells us that Jesus, after he raised Lazarus from the dead, slipped away for a little while, taught and spent some time with his disciples, but knew that during Passover, he was going to go back to Jerusalem where the temple was located and fulfill the final events of his life leading up to his crucifixion and resurrection. And so today we pick up with Jesus entering Jerusalem and the response of the people who had heard most of them about the raising of Lazarus and were familiar with Jesus, but didn't yet quite know exactly who he was or what he was about. So let's look together at this passage as we start this Holy Week together. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Now we hear a lot about palm branches and clothes on the road and that's not that really unusual in Old Testament times. Um, anybody who was sort of heralding or crowning someone they thought would be a king, uh, they would cut palm branches off trees or they would take uh, their jacket off and lay it in the road. It was a way to show respect. It mentioned several times in the Old Testament. Jesus, of course, came into town riding on an animal that had been produced predicted and prophesied. So it was very specific. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and they asked, who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. So Jesus had entered Jerusalem and the countdown had begun. Now the people we're saying two things, Hosanna and son of David. So what does Hosanna mean? Now, before we do that, I want you to shout out just like the crowd did, Hosanna, son of David. But we're not gonna do it at the same time. We're gonna do it, Hosanna, and then we're gonna do son of David. Are you ready? Okay, Hosanna, and I'm gonna count to three and you're gonna yell Hosanna, right? One, two, three, Hosanna. And then son of David coming next, one, two, three, Son of David. So what does Hosanna mean? Hosanna is a word that's um, familiar to the first century Jewish people, but not familiar to us. Even though we say it, we may not know what it means. In Psalm 118, we see a little bit of evidence here as it's defined. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna means I beg you to save us or please deliver us. So it's a word that's very personal. And it's a word that as a crowd was saying it together, those going before and those going behind Jesus, 
They were literally calling out, I beg you, please save us. Now the question is, who are they talking to? And another question is, what do they want to be saved from? And we'll get there in just a second. Let's move on here to this next phrase, son of David. You know, David himself had sons and we've talked about David's sons. He had one son who was murdered by another son for doing some things in the family that he shouldn't have done. He had one son who ended up being hung in a tree by his hair and poked with a spear. We talked about David's sons, but, but the Bible calls Jesus son of David. Jesus lived a thousand years after David did. Yet 17 times in the New Testament, we see Jesus was called son of David. The Old Testament prophesies that Jesus will come from the line of David. And Matthew traces Jesus' lineage all the way back to his adopted father, Joseph, or from his adopted father, Joseph, back to David. Luke 3 traces Jesus' genealogy through his mother, Mary, back to David. And so what this literally means is, is that Jesus will come from the line of David. He'll be a descendant of David. Now, why is that significant? Because the descendant of David that these people were talking about, Jesus was a very specific person who had been prophesied about. Let's look at this together. The gospel he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and who through the spirit of holiness was appointed the son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ, our Lord. The son of David means Jesus was the Messiah. Now the Messiah means deliverer or promised one. The people wanted Jesus to deliver them. Jesus was the Messiah who was promised. They were begging Jesus to come and deliver them, but deliver them from what? The people were concerned about their social situation. They were concerned about their politics. They were concerned about the economic downturn in the society in which they lived. They were concerned about unfair oppression by a government that had no authority spiritually over them. They were tired of being harassed and bullied and they wanted something to be done about it. But what they had in mind was something totally different than what Jesus had in mind. They wanted something and they were thinking certain thoughts that Jesus wasn't thinking. God's plan was far different than their plan. And it blew the people's minds. When they found out what Jesus' plan really was, they turned their back on him that ultimately it led them or him to the cross. We've got some kids who've come in today. Our children are gonna sing for us and um, it's gonna be a great way for us to start what we're doing here uh, during this Holy Week, during Easter. And you'll see in just a minute as we talk about the Monday in Jesus' life, that there were kids who were left in the temple who sang Jesus' praises and that the children who were left in the temple singing Jesus' praises sang so loud and so enthusiastically that it got all of the attention of the religious leaders of the day. And they didn't like it, but Jesus, of course, loved it because even the Old Testament in the book of Psalms talks about children singing praises to God. And so you're gonna be able to hear that now. And if you guys want, you can just come on up since we're out. So the temple was really important in Jewish life and Jesus visited the temple in Jerusalem quite a bit. We don't have temples, we have church, but the parallels, oh, they're somewhat consistent. And I wanna to talk to you for a minute about the temple because the temple was the very center of not just Jewish life, but a city of Jerusalem, which was the holy city. And Solomon built the temple um, originally, uh, Solomon being David's son, if you remember the story when we talked about this, in the fall and Solomon's temple was destroyed. It was destroyed in about 586 BC. And when it was destroyed in 586 BC, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Daniel, they were all taken hostage and some stories that we've studied and love sort of ensued. And um, the temple was rebuilt by Herod not too long later. 
And Herod rebuilt the temple to appease the Jewish people, and he built a magnificent temple. And in your app, if you want to see what Herod's temple may have looked like, there are diagrams, and there's even a video, a link to a video walkthrough of what this temple may have looked like so that you can follow along and see. But I want to describe it to you. On the outside of the temple, there was the court of the Gentiles, and the court of the Gentiles was a very large courtyard that anybody could come and worship no matter what, anyone. And if you were a Gentile, if you fit into their churchy model, if you were a Jew, uh, if you were somewhere in between, you hadn't quite decided who you were, and they could come and they could pray and they could worship, and then there was a gate. Now, every gate had some stairs, and so they would go up a few stairs, and the first gate was called the beautiful gate in between the court of the Gentiles and the court of women. And there was a sign that said, um, basically, trespassers will be shot. Um, what it really said is, if you're a Gentile and you pass this gate, you're going to die. And uh, no Gentiles were allowed to go up into the court of women. Now, in the court of women, or the courtyard of women, and this was Jewish culture, and, and they had segregated worship and things that we don't have and that Jesus actually changed. Um, but they had a, a trumpet-shaped offering receptacle that the women were able to put their offerings in um, for a purification and such. And then there was another set of stairs. And so they would be down at the bottom of the stairs. If you were a Jewish man, you could walk up the stairs. You went through a gate called the Nikian Gate. The Nikian Gate was made of Corinthian bronze and it took 20 people to open and shut this gate. As they went up to the courtyard of the men, of the Israelites, if they were offering a sacrifice, which they did in the temple, a sacrifice for sin, um, they would take their sacrifices with them and they would go back up yet to another set of stairs and another gate. And they would pass their sacrifices up to the courtyard of the priests. And the courtyard of the priests, they would take these animals, these sacrifices, and they would either burn the offerings or have a blood offering sacrifice. And you could watch through a peephole and make sure that they had done your offerings correctly. Now, there was another set of stairs from the courtyard of the priests up to the Holy of Holies, or at least another courtyard, about 600 square feet. And in that room or in that courtyard, there was a small little house, a little hut that had a curtain dividing it. And inside or behind the curtain was the Ark of the Covenant. You could only go in. The high priest at this point was Annas one time a year on the Day of Atonement. And if they messed up their duties, uh, they died. The high priest had to have bells tied to his garment at the bottom and a rope tied to his leg. And if he didn't do exactly what God told him to do, he died. God took his life. And when the bell stopped moving, they drug him out by the leg and put another priest in there to take care of it. So it was a very serious business. Now, Jesus, after he entered Jerusalem, went back to Bethany where Lazarus, Mary, and Martha lived. But then the next day he came to the temple and it's interesting because he does something that people don't necessarily think is very Jesus-like. He drives money changers from the temple. Now, Jesus didn't run up to the Holy of Holies in this story. He entered the courtyard of the Gentiles in this story, the very most common lowest level of the temple that had been exploited by the high priest. They had created something called the Bazaar of Annas. It was a festival or a fair um, really, that's not a great description. Tables and booths set to make money off people. If you were to bring a sacrifice, for example, to Jerusalem for Passover, and you had raised a goat or a sheep, and you brought this goat or sheep, and it was the very best you had, you'd have to go before a temple inspector in the Bazaar of Annas in the courtyard, and they would look at your goat or sheep, and they would tell you it's not good enough. And they would sell you one for five or six times the price. Now, You'd have to pay because there was no other way to be right with God. They would take your goat or your sheep and go around to the back of the line and put it in the back of the line and then sell it to the next person who came up as being good enough when yours wasn't good enough. They had temple money. If you came from a region that didn't use the same money as the temple, then you had to change your money and they changed it at exorbitant rates. Unbelievable. I mean, it was extortion. It was corrupt and the people had made the temple the religious leaders and the priest about them, their own personal comfort, their own personal gain, their agenda. It was no longer about worship and the two things the temple was intended to be about, confession of sin and proclaiming God's goodness. So Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out all the people, buying and selling animals for sacrifice. 
He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. Now, I love this kind of picture because Jesus didn't do this by a word. He didn't go into the money changers and into the tables and say, leave. This is literally Jesus who is knocking over tables, kicking over tables and driving people out. Now, in John chapter two, Jesus started his ministry by a visit to the temple. And the Bible says that he took well, he went outside to this, of the temple and took some time braiding a whip, went back into the temple and drove out the money changers and chastised them for creating religion, making it man-made, making it about them. This was Jesus who was angry, but had not sinned. Perfect, yet reclaiming his church. He said to them, the scriptures declare my temple will be called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. And then who was left? The blind and the lame. Those of us who know our need for him. Where else would they go? Jesus kicked over tables, drove out criminals, people who had made church about them. And the ones who had no place or person else to go to had stuck around, watching perhaps, a little curious, and then going to Jesus, who still in some supernatural way was safe for people like the blind and the lame, and you'll see in a second, the children. The leading priests and teachers of the religious law saw these miracles as Jesus had healed these people and they even heard the children in the temple shouting, praise God for the son of David. But the leaders were indignant and they said, how in the world do you expect these kids to go uncorrupted with your antics? And Jesus said to them, don't you know the scriptures, the Psalms say, you've taught the kids to worship. And how did the kids know what to say? They had seen their parents say the same thing the day before. How profound is it that the children had heard their parents say, Hosanna, son of David, but not meaning the same thing as these children now almost certainly meant having witnessed for themselves the compassion, the justice, but a miracle of Jesus. And Jesus said, these little children, they're worshiping me, but haven't you read the Old Testament? And then after doing this, he returned to Bethany to Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' house where he stayed overnight. Now, Jeremiah talked about the corruption of the temple. Jeremiah wrote a letter or a book to people who had made religion about themselves. It was a book to warn them of the coming judgment and to remind them of how important it was to make sure that the object of our worship was God and that we didn't flip the paradigm like the people, well, the children of Israel in Jeremiah's time had done and also in Jesus' time where they had made worship about them. Who are you worshiping? Or do I expect the one I should be worshiping to worship me, to make me happy, comfortable, rid me of my grievances and solve my problems? Is it about me or perhaps about God? Let's look at Jeremiah together. This is the word that came to the Lord or to Jeremiah from the Lord. Stand at the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim this message. Hear the word of the Lord, all you people of Judah who come through these gates to worship the Lord. This is what the Lord, the God Almighty, the God of Israel says. Reform your ways and your actions and I will let you live in this place. Do not trust in deceptive words and say, this is the church of Jesus. This is the church of the Lord. This is the church of things that are truly and genuinely spiritual. And he says, be careful about your relationships with each other. Stop being unjust, stop exploiting, stop always trying to win. Stop trying to make everything about you to demand that your needs are met, but live your life 
as on mission, as part of something bigger than you are, for someone. And unfortunately, in Jeremiah's time, the people didn't listen. But Jesus had come back full circle, giving another chance for the children of Israel, the Jews, to learn what worship was all about. And it's really about two things. These were the two actions that people did in the temple. Number one, they confessed sin. And they confessed it in different ways. They confessed it through sacrifice, which thankfully we don't have to do. You don't have to raise goats and sheep and take them to church and have the pastor kill the goats and sheep to atone temporarily for your sin. Thank goodness that time is over. That would be, well, it'd be weird, but it was required back in Jesus' day. And he was getting ready to deliver himself up as the final sacrifice. So we didn't have to live like that anymore, but we still offer sacrifice in some way. Romans 12 says that we offer ourselves, our bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable, pleasing to God, because it's our reasonable act of service. And one of the things that they did is they confessed sin. Now there's two types of being right with God. The first type is called positional righteousness. And this is the, the type of being right with God that happens when you become a Christian. When you confess your sin and ask for forgiveness, when you tell God that you believe who Jesus is and you wanna to follow him with your life, that you wanna be a follower, a disciple, and you become saved, you become a Christian. And once you become a Christian, it can never be taken from you. It's permanent. You never have to be made right with God again. It's called positional righteousness. Your position is set, it's sealed. But there's also something called practical righteousness. And that's like any relationship. If you're married and you do things, to your husband or wife or choose not to that you know are wrong, you may still be married, but things aren't right. And I don't know about your spouse, but my spouse has a way of letting me know. Now, she's never said I'm leaving, but she has said to me, you should change your ways. And you know what? She's right. There's a practical righteousness where when we have thoughts, actions, and attitudes that creep into our lives that displease God, we're responsible to deal with them because it creates distance between us and God. And God calls us to close the distance, waits for us to close the distance. King David prayed in the Psalms, Reveal to me the sin that lurks within me, my paraphrase. Those things I know are there, give me the courage to confess. Those things that I'm unaware of, show me those things. Because I don't want any distance between God and between me. Thoughts, actions, sometimes one time, oftentimes repetitive, Listen to this next one, attitudes about and toward other people and oftentimes an entitled attitude toward myself. Thoughts, actions, and attitudes that are displeasing to God. That is one of the prayers that God desires to hear from his people. And one of the things that was ordained to be done for the Jewish people at the temple, for us every day in our lives, as Jesus Christ is now, or took the place of the high priest. And we no longer have to, to go through steps and religion to get to God. The second purpose of church or the temple is to declare God's goodness and to worship him. 
Open my lips, Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice or I would bring it to you. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. God, you will not despise. You ever think something and don't say it? Sometimes it's a good thing. Sometimes it's not. But true worship and praise to God is thinking something and saying something. What is it you love about God? The greatness of God. And will you tell him? As we start Holy Week together, I wanna encourage you to do these two things. To ask the Holy Spirit of God to examine your heart and to show you if there's any thought, action, or attitude displeasing to him in you. To reveal if you've made worship about you or if you're worshiping God. To show you if you view the world in terms of what you can receive or if you view the world and how you can contribute. To ask God to show you these things. And then once he shows you, to confess them. And the second thing I want us to do beginning today, throughout the week, and perhaps at 8.30 in the morning, as Pastor Jared pushes the notification to the church app with your day of activities that Jesus did and the scripture that corresponds, that you might stop and do these two things each day that we're gonna do this morning together. And that is to think of the great things about God. And not just the ways he's blessed you, but who he is. And then have the courage, the courtesy, and the love to tell him. Because these two things were lost in the temple. And Jesus came to set right the attitude that had become so wrong. I've asked Pastor Dan if he'll come up and pray with me for you. And um, I just want, as we pray, for you to examine your hearts, to start this week on the right foot with the Lord, to follow in the footsteps of King David as he prayed, God, the things I know aren't right in my heart, give me the courage to make them right today. And the things that lurk within me that I don't know about, show me those things because I want to close the distance between you and between me. And sometimes you'll see that the infractions have to do primarily with you and in your mind, but oftentimes you'll see that they have to do with people around you and there may be a little work to do. As um, we lead these folks in prayer, would you start by just um, helping lead us in a prayer of awareness and confession of sin? And then I'll start with the prayer of telling God how great he is and how much we love him. Heavenly Father, we do come before you today thanking you for your goodness and grace, grace giving us what we don't deserve and mercy not giving us what we do deserve. And so as we've learned today, Lord, we don't have to, we want to keep our relationship with you close. So I pray the prayer of David, as Pastor Rick mentioned in Psalms 139, Lord, did I pray in my own life and I pray for my friends today that you would, that we would take time, even in this moment to search, search me, oh God, because you know my heart and test me so you can expose those anxious thoughts. And Lord, point out in me anything that offends you. Those thoughts, actions, or attitudes. And in that moment, it's amazing, Holy Spirit, how you bring some of these things to mind. And Lord, when you do bring these things to mind as you do in my life and Pastor Rick's life, our 
our team, as we walk with you, Lord, we want to be close. And in this confession, when you bring up those thoughts, actions, and attitudes, 1 John 1, 9 tells us something very simple. That if we confess those, name them by name. If we confess our sins before you, that you forgive us of not only those sins, but you give us a clean slate. And Lord, for those thoughts, attitudes, and actions that whatever have come to our head, our heart, as Rick would coach us on, Pastor Rick, I I pray that um, in our mind, our thoughts talking to you, that we confess that. And because of the blood of Jesus, we can get forgiveness, a clean slate, and we start new this very moment. So Lord, as you search us, as you test us, as you point out anything in us that doesn't bring you glory, Lord, we also, the last part of that verse, would you please lead us? For we need you and we want you. In Jesus' name. And you have forgiven us. You've shown us grace. You gave us Jesus who gave us life. And we acknowledge to you that our lives are yours, that our church is yours, that worship is about you. You deserve it. It's a privilege to be able to be a follower of Jesus, to be a citizen of the kingdom of God. You bless us in so many ways. You take care of us. You love us. You give us strength when we need it. You give us patience to endure. And I just thank you for stories like this. It seems a little peculiar that Jesus began his ministry here on earth and one of the last things that he did before his crucifixion was to go into the temple and to remind everyone who worship was all about. And so we just affirm that today. We acknowledge that in our own lives. We pledge to you that this week will be a week of reflection and contemplation as we ask you to reveal in us sin that may be lurking. It'll be a week of declaring how good you are to you and to anyone around us who will listen. It's the least we could do. On this week, we call Holy Week. And each day as we follow along in the footsteps of Jesus, as they lead or led him toward the cross, draw us in closer until we meet again on Friday night. As we celebrate Good Friday, the Last Supper, communion. And then come again next Sunday on Easter to proclaim and celebrate the resurrection of our risen Savior, our Lord, Jesus Christ. You've done all that, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.